Well, bah! I just realized I haven't got the coat on. This feels very incomplete. Today's video is about Oliver Cromwell. Cousin Ollie! Ollie! Merry Christmas, old bean! Oh, relatives. This was a requested video. Oliver Cromwell was one of probably one of the most divisive figures in British and Irish history. To some, he was a hero who laid the foundations for modern democracy. Uh, to others, including me, he was a power-hungry tyrant with a delusional sense of grandeur. I am always... Always unbiased when I do these. And this will be an unbiased take. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Oliver Cromwell was born on the 25th of April 1599 to Robert and Elizabeth Cromwell. Cromwell's family wasn't really that wealthy, but it was part of the gentry and it was very, very well connected. His family was so well connected that his father actually served in Elizabeth II. Wrong Elizabeth did that his father actually served in, in the parliament of Elizabeth I. The only relatively decent Tudor monarch. <laughs> Cromwell was related to, but not a direct descendant of, Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's chief minister. You know, the one that... Henry VIII had a thing for that. Maybe he had a fetish. This relation came from Cromwell's great-great-grandmother, Catherine, who married Morgan Williams. And they decided to take on Thomas Cromwell's surname um, in honour of Thomas Cromwell. Cromwell was educated at Huntingdon Grammar School, now the Cromwell Museum, because apparently that's something the world needs, but I'm un unbiased. Later, he would also study at Sydney Sussex College, which had heavy Puritan influences. This will be important later. In 1620, he married Elizabeth Bosher. Cromwell's father would die when he was only 18, leaving him only a few acres of land. This helped to fuel a sort of fire in him. Not a good fire. While he was a councilman in his hometown of Huntingdon, he would end up being thrown out and completely removed from the council for causing a ruckus and foreshadowing there. Cromwell sold his freehold and became a tenant of Henry Lawrence. This was possibly because he was planning to emigrate to New England with Henry, but the plan seemingly failed. A Puritan preacher named Joe Tukey convinced Cromwell that his suffering was a test by God. It is an act of God, isn't it? From this moment on, Cromwell was a devout Puritan. These were sort of extremist Protestants. If, if you've ever gone to a party and there's the one guy in the corner moaning about everyone, that's a Puritan. Oh my God, I'm a Puritan. I'm joking, I'm not. I don't want to be involved with what's about to go down. Trommel was terrified that he was destined for hell. And then once he became saved by Joe Tukey, he was convinced that God had chosen him, or he was one of God's chosen. He will morph into a formidable fighting force known to one and all as the Power Ranger. This would begin his religious fanaticism. Cromwell in Parliament. In 1625, the useless Parliament refused to pl um, pass any of Charles I's laws, predominantly raising taxes, and this began a series of dissolvement and recalling of Parliament, which would help deteriorate the relationship between the monarchy and the parliamentary system. In 1628, Parliament would be recalled by Charles I in order to raise taxes for yet another disastrous war. Cromwell was actually in the front row of this Parliament. Charles resorted to using forced loans. And they are exactly what they, they sound like, except when you loan charles the money you're not getting any back <laughs> this money was then used by lord buckingham who was very close to charles they 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 got on very very well and to to, to start wars with spain and france in varying relations of alliances buckingham would later be assassinated by a young army officer failing in his continental endeavors charles the first sought to make religious reforms in his ancestral homeland of scotland <laughs> This started the Bishop's Wars, which Charles lost almost completely. And the Scots, in entirely Scottish fashion, simply told Charles where to go. 
on the flip of a coin, things were looking up for a different character in this story. 1636, a childless uncle would die, leaving Cromwell a house and extensive lands in the cathedral city of Ely, restoring Cromwell to prominence. This comes at a crucial time as the Puritans were currently being oppressed by Charles. His wife was Catholic, as was much of his court, and the religion he practised seemed like this blend of Catholicism and Protestantism that favoured Catholicism. Many feared that a similar reformation to that of Mary I was on the way. A horrific crime of which Mary found herself trapped in mirrors and taunted by American teenage girls for centuries to come. Charles I abolished Parliament again in 1629 and ruled alone for 11 years. However, Charles was forced to recall Parliament again in 1640, which he argued with immediately and got rid of him again, giving its name the Short Parliament. But then six months later, he would recall them and this would begin the Long Parliament. It's called the Long Parliament because it went a long time without being dissolved. <laughs> With all this arguing going on, Parliament delivered Charles with what Sanknet was known as the Great Remonstrance, which was basically just a massive list of all the things that Parliament hated about Charles. Charles, understandably, was upset by this list and just simply chose to ignore it. <laughs> he was infuriated by the simple audacity of these MPs to, to deliver this list. At this point, the MP for Cambridge would come into play. Oliver... Cromwell. Turning up with blood on his collar, he put a lot of people off on their first day of Parliament because he just wasn't dressed correctly. Who turns up to Parliament with blood? Why did he have blood on his collar? It is referenced that he acted like a bull in a china shop. Cromwell was related to nine other MPs, all Puritans and all spoiling for a fight. Cromwell wasn't the most prominent person at this point, but they were all asking for a limit to Charles's power. To make matters worse, in October of that year, the Catholics had rebelled in Ireland and massacred Protestant settlers. <laughs> massacred Protestant settlers. Massacred Protestant settlers. Curse my Essex accent! To make matters worse, in October of that year, the Catholics had rebelled in Ireland and massacred Protestant settlers. These stories are taken and then used to fuel anti-Catholic propaganda across the British Isles and in parts of Europe. Although it's certain that these atrocities did occur, a lot of them may have been overblown or obviously on the opposite side of things, underblown. <laughs> That's not even a word! But they definitely did happen and this will come into play later. On the 4th of January 1642, Charles led soldiers into Parliament to arrest five members of Parliament who it turned out weren't there. They'd been tipped off. On the 10th of January, Charles would leave London fearing for his life. At this point, Charles and Parliament would begin to raise independent armies. The tension didn't fade, and in August, the Civil War would begin. For two years, the two sides would be stuck in a deadlock. However, there was a specific colonel who was about to change things. Oliver Cromwell would lead the Roundheads, or the Parliamentarians, uh, recruiting men from East Anglia and training them himself. These were known specifically as Cromwell's Ironsides. Human has been burned. It's also worth noting that at this point, Cromwell was well into his 40s, beginning a military career. Cromwell defamed a few of his fellow officers in the parliamentary army as being profane and loose, getting away with saying this because he was protected by his friends. Cromwell's unit was so strict that no one could swear without punishment. Cromwell recruited not from rank or title, but for someone's religious fervour and their belief in the cause, in what they were fighting for. He is quoted as saying, a better a plain man than none. Personally, I don't believe he had them plain. He must have had at least some seasoning. Jokes aside, and we came up to the highlights of Cromwell's military career at Marsden Moor, when he faced a make-or-break moment for the parliamentary cause. On the opposing side was Prince Rupert of the Rhine, the nephew to Charles and notorious for cavalry charges. The two armies would face off all day, and in the late afternoon, Cromwell attacked, smashing into the cavalier royalist right flank. Whilst Rupert was having dinner... Cromwell is noted as being chopped across the neck, Marsden Moor, but immediately got himself back into the fray, and I do hate the guy, but to be fair, <laughs> that is some mad lad energy. Cromwell would charge his cavalry a second time, which was unconventional for the warfare of the period, and this had devastating effect on the cavaliers, or the royalists. Cromwell is, is stated as having a terrifying expression on his face. 
quite honestly, I think he was clearly vibing what was going on. Marston Moor was one of the bloodiest battles ever fought on English soil, and it obliterated the King's Northern Army. Cromwell would chase the retreating cavaliers back to York, mercilessly and brutally killing anyone they could. The total death toll reached 4,000, with a further 2,000 wounded dying later. Cromwell's nephew even died after having his leg amputated. In the first age of pure journalism, both sides began mass printing propaganda. The Royalist press painting Cromwell as a lunatic, waving across the battlefield, seeking blood wherever he could find it. Parliament showed him as a hero. Parliament, however, would begin to consider peace, but Cromwell moved to completely crush the Royalists. He sought to enforce a pure revolution with his brand new model army. At the Battle of Naseby, Cromwell's army would smash the Cavaliers again. A year later, they controlled the country, forcing Charles to flee to the hands of the Scots. The Scots then sold him to, to Parliament for £400,000. A thousand pounds? I should say about a thousand pounds. After this, Cromwell falls back into a depressed state. Charles relied on the discontent and lack of pay uh, amongst the new model army, 18,000 of which now threatened to march on London. Charles hoped he could use Cromwell's fervorous revolutionary force as a bargaining tool against Parliament, pitting the two sides directly against each other. As time went on, however, the army became more radical and moved past just wanting their pay and pushed for greater control of the country. One request was for all men, not, not women, to be given the right to vote. Cromwell is immediately torn between his army and his parliament. Thomas Rainsborough put forward the demands for his new faction known as the Levellers. Cromwell's son-in-law, Henry Ireton, fought the hardest against the Levellers. Cromwell tried desperately to keep the peace amongst the parliamentarian side. He went as far as asking for a committee and to simply rely on God. Shortly after this, Cromwell received the miracle he so desperately needed. Charles I managed to escape the tower. This managed to quell the levellers and push for a united front once again leaving some to suggest that Cromwell may have organised the escape. Charles was quickly recaptured though. This didn't stop the total divide between the army and parliament. Soon after, two regiments of the army would mutiny. Fine. Mutiny. In a field near Ware, forcing Cromwell to act. He rode amongst the mutineers and managed to bring them back to order. He then decided to shoot one of the ringleaders, which would be decided by a game of dice. Because Russian roulette hadn't been invented yet. Before we carry on with the video, it's time to speak about the sponsors and today we are sponsored by it's me so as you know i'm on patreon that's the best place to support me you can get monthly things like sneak peeks and the video 48 hours earlier you also get better discord ranks um, i do have a discord link is in the link tree below i have a book it's on amazon you can check it out link is in also the link tree below i now have a merch store i have one in the us and one in the uk so Go Wild, that is in a separate link, but it is also in my link tree, just so in case you don't miss it. So if you want the History Daddy logo on a t-shirt or a mask, I think I've got some masks, I don't know, have a look in the store. I spend a lot of time setting it up, so yeah, it's there, enjoy, okay, bye. If, if, you, if you're not vibing any of those, just like, subscribe, and share. And that is the best way to support me. Someone is playing aggressively loud music outside, and I would like to tell them to shush! Because daddy's talking. Cromwell and the Second Civil War. Charles began forming an alliance of Irish Confederates, Scots and Royalists in early 1648. The Royalist alliance eventually felt confident enough to strike. Charles cut a deal with the Scots to make England Presbyterian if they invaded and restored him to the throne. Royalist uprisings in southern England and Wales would paralyse the country, but the Scots were very slow to act and the Second Civil War sort of whimpered into silence. The Second Civil War convinced Cromwell that Charles had rejected the will of God, and he was even more angry that the Scots had been pulled in. The mock trial of Charles I. Henry Ireton purged Parliament of all members who wished to pursue negotiations with the King, something Cromwell denied any involvement in. On the 6th of December 1648, a troop led by former brewer Thomas Pride ensured only members of Parliament who supported the army had access to Parliament. This caused a rump Parliament, and they voted 
to put the king on trial. Shock. Horror. It was, in effect, a coup, which Cromwell believed was sent and blessed by God. He brings this up a lot. The army selected the judges, but Charles believed he would win, as Charles thought it was impossible to try a king. Isn't high treason a crime against the king? And surely you are the king. Precisely. However, when he used his cane to prod one of the accusers, the top fell off, and no one picked it up for him. According to some historians, It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. Cromwell, who once wished to preserve the monarchy, now stood steadfast as seven judges disappeared and the remainder stayed behind to sign the death warrant of a king. It is rumoured that Cromwell began to act like a schoolboy and giggle as he signed away the life of the most important man in Britain. Charles was executed in his old home in Whitehall with one blow. Charles's head was held to the crowd and it is reported that they were horrified and believed God would have his vengeance. The Cromwellian Conquest of Ireland. The Royalists signed the Second Ormond Peace with the Irish Confederates who ruled two-thirds of Ireland from 1641 to the completion of Cromwell's conquest, bringing the two unlikely allies against a bigger foe. Even the Ulster Scots would join the alliance. Cromwell was so hated he bought the Protestant English Royalists, the Irish Catholics and the Ulster Scots together to take him down. These people, at any other point in history, hated each other. But they hated Cromwell and the Parliamentarians more. To justify this conquest, Cromwell would use the sworn testimonies of 3,500 Protestants who had fled from Dublin and Cork during the rebellion. The notorious massacre of Protestants at Porter Down in Armagh, which had seen planters taken from their homes and forced to drown in the River Barn. In actuality, the Cromwellian conquest of Ireland was mainly seen as a way to obliterate the Irish Confederates and the English Royalists in one foul swoop. Cromwell may have seen this as a religious crusade. Parliament saw it as a way to get rid of everything that was inconveniencing them. There were some parliamentarians, however, who saw the invasion of Ireland as righteous vengeance for the massacre of Protestants during the Irish Confederate Wars, which were funded, at least in part, by Pope Innocent X. Uh, it was the only territory Parliament still had in Ireland, or had any control of in Ireland, was Dublin. A combined Royalist and Irish Confederate force would attempt to take the city, but the attempts would fail. Cromwell believed he was given a mercy from God. One of the first place Cromwell would attack and lay siege to was Drogda. The garrison of Drogda believed that Cromwell couldn't take the city, and its governor, Arthur Ashton, an English royalist, was even quoted saying to Cromwell, he who could take Drogda could take hell. At this moment, Cromwell would begin his attack. Cromwell and his men overran the town while Ashton and a few remaining soldiers would hold up in a windmill, however they did eventually surrender. Cromwell then slaughtered them all. Uh, Ashton was actually beaten to death with his own wooden leg, which Cromwell's forces believed hid gold. Cromwell then had the rest of the garrison slaughtered, and Cromwell himself estimated that this was about 2,000 men. Moving on to Wexford, the parliamentarian troops broke into the town during negotiations of surrender, killing 2,000 soldiers and 1,500 civilians, burning much of the town to the ground. Stories of the people being brutally murdered in churches and other vicious attacks led many cities and other settlements to surrender upon the arrival of Cromwell's new model army. Munster would fall after a mutiny in Cork, and this forced the Irish forces to retreat to Connacht and up in the hills of Kerry. Their last stronghold was in the city of Limerick. A siege followed, lasting two months long and led by the English force, now eager to end the conflict, eventually starving out the defenders. The English army would actually only meet one serious loss, and that was at the Siege of Clonmel. The remaining 30,000 Royalists and Irish Confederates carried on fighting in brutal guerrilla campaigns, becoming known as Tories. Yes, I, uh, I also have the image of Boris Johnson hiding in the hills, grinning while taking out small patrols of Cromwell's men. Why? I don't know, but I feel like he would vibe that. From this moment, the parliamentarians couldn't venture more than two miles outside of a city without being set upon by what they called brigands, the, the Tories. They began forcibly evicting civilians and destroyed crops and food stocks in a desperate attempt to stop the Tories. 
This starved the population who were mostly sent to the American colonies. The guerrilla war would officially come to an end in 1652, although small portions of the Tories would continue to fight for another century. Anyone who was remotely connected to rebellion was captured and executed. Anyone who supported the rebellion, including many Catholics, were expelled from their own land. This was then given to English veterans, taking the land ownership of Irish Catholics from 60% before the conquest to 92% in the hands of Protestants who were mainly veterans in Cromwell's army. You could argue, but Ryan, you love Alexander the Great, you love Rome, you love the Byzantines, and you even love the British Empire. Why are you shitting on Cromwell so much? Because it's good to look at those things and find the positive while also criticising the things that you love so that you can improve on them in the future. But I cannot think of a single positive for Cromwell. Um, to be fair to him, Cromwell did have an informal agreement to let the Jews come back to the country. Here's a little snippet from like the official Cromwell website. I, I didn't know about this when I was filming and it was brought to my attention, so I thought it would include it to show a full unbiased perspective. Cromwell's conquest of Ireland would become known as the Curse of Cromwell, and he would conquer Ireland in just nine months. Historian Brendan Harris even went as far as saying he believes that there are events that weren't recorded, like villages being burned from the map and Cromwell's activities being excused as just part of being normal for that time. However, it is estimated that over 200,000 people would die and 40,000 people were deported for forced labour or slavery. Cromwell would return victorious to a parliament more divided than ever and he would once again side with his soldiers and exactly as Charles had a disbanded parliament, forging himself as the most powerful man in Britain. Cromwell asked the parishes to select the most pious Puritan men, not women, to form a parliament of saints. To begin with, this parliament passed laws improving the conditions of debtors and lunatics and prisoners. Yet, this parliament collapsed in on itself after six months as these saintly men began arguing over various upper-class things such as land ownership and tax. Cromwell was horrified by this, to give him credit. In 1654, Cromwell brought a close to the Anglo-Dutch War, and in an attempt to find another use for his army, Cromwell attempted to forge an alliance with France so that he could attack Spain. May of 1655, he would manage to conquer Jamaica, so congrats. And to be fair, though, at least, you know, he gave us some interesting missions in Assassin's Creed Black Flag then. Cromwell then decided to dissolve Parliament in the same year uh, because they tried to limit the power of his army and limit his army. At this point, Cromwell's allies finally began to turn on him. In September of 1656, Cromwell was forced to bring back Parliament, which, to be honest, a bit weak, bro. Charles lasted 11 years. Uh, this, ha However, he hand-picked this parliament, which surprisingly voted to make Cromwell king in 1657. Already referred to as Your Highness and living in Charles's old home, I guess it made sense. And on the 26th of June, 1657, Cromwell would have a lavish but rushed ceremony where he became known as the Lord Protector of England, Scotland and Ireland. However, he also gained another title and nickname of King Oliver, which was a detrimental nickname comparing his similarities and his similar actions to Charles I. Ironic. Uh, Cromwell now had a large budget for personal luxury and was allowed to live at Hampton Court Palace, although in spite of this he asked painters to paint him honestly and his wife ensured he only ate plain food. Although I think this was probably because he was getting on at this point and probably couldn't handle anything other than plain bread at four o'clock in the afternoon. That being said, Cromwell did like to dance and drink, despite banning Christmas and the theatre. Then he slithered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant around each new home, and he took every present. Cromwell's army would soon begin oppressing the population. Drinking, prostitution and other hedonistic activities were cracked down on hard. Like speakeasies during the American Prohibition or an impromptu rave in modern day Essex, these festivities carried on and if they caught wind of someone coming to 
you know, be a party pooper, they would have disappeared by the time the zealot Puritans could get near them. Cromwell decided it was best to distance himself from his foot soldiers at this point in time, and he was also reportedly disappointed in the behaviour of his fellow Puritans, such as their capture and torture of James Naylor. Cromwell actually pointed out this irony of the Puritans now being the oppressors when they had been so badly oppressed, and it's really lucky that he was setting a good example. It is sarcasm 101. The death of God's chosen. In his later years, Cromwell reflected back on his life in despair and wished that he had simply tended a flock of sheep, apparently regretting most of the things he had done or failed to do. On top of this, Cromwell may have actually had kidney stones, and in 1658, after battling a malarial fever, Cromwell would suffer another urinary infection. In February 1658, Parliament tried to readmit members of Parliament that Cromwell had banned and was promptly dissolved. His daughter would die of cancer later that year, and this tipped Cromwell over the edge and he retreated within himself. On the 3rd of September 1658, Cromwell died aged 59 in his bed. On the same night, a brutal storm would rage and it was said that this was Satan come to claim Cromwell's soul. His body was poorly embalmed and hastily buried. His son, Richard, would rule for a year before being deposed and the rump returned to power. Quickly, an army general called George Monk ordered Parliament to bring back its excluded members, which restored the long Parliament. This voted for its own dissolution. On the 30th of January 1661, Cromwell's remains would be interred 12 years to the day of Charles I's execution. He would be ceremoniously hung along with the corpses of two other parliamentarians and then beheaded. His head would be displayed on a spike outside Westminster until 1685. Ultimately, how you view Cromwell is up to you. I hope this entirely unbiased outlook at the most hated man in the history of the British Isles helped you make an informed decision. Although, the black flag joke has got me thinking. I wonder if there was any pirates that pillaged the shores of Europe. Perhaps a pirate queen. See you in the next one.